Today we present the Introduction, Mycobacteriology, Pathogenesis, and Epidemiology of Pediatric TB. Today's presenter is Dr. Anna Alvarez. Dr. Alvarez is a graduate of the School of Medicine, Universidad de Panama. She did her residency training in pediatrics in, at Metro Health Medical Center and her fellowship in pediatric infectious disease at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, Case Western Reserve University, both in Cleveland, Ohio. Since 2005, she has been the pediatric consultant for the Southeastern National TB Center and faculty of the Comprehensive Clinical TB course sponsored by the SNTC. In 2013, she was appointed by the Secretary of Health and Human Services to the Advisory Council on the Elimination of Tuberculosis of the CDC. Dr. Alvarez is currently an Associate Professor at the University of Florida College of Medicine in Jacksonville, Florida in the, pedi in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Disease and Immunology. It's my pleasure to turn this over to Dr. Alvarez. Anna? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Donna. Karen. Um, all right, let's, let's go ahead and start. Welcome, everybody. Uh, in, just uh, start with the objectives. So my goal is that by the end of this presentation, you will be able to recognize the epidemiology of tuberculosis in the United States and in the world, identify some of the typical microbiologic characteristics of mycobacterium tuberculosis, describe the pathogenesis of TB, and recognize the risk factors for tuberculosis infection and disease. I'd like to start with a case to illustrate several, several points. So this is a six-year-old Bosnian male who presented to our local emergency department with a one-week history of fever and occasional vomiting. He had no history of cough, difficulty breathing, or weight loss. Um, his social history was relevant because uh, he and his parents and a younger sibling had immigrated to the United States from Bosnia about six months before he presented to the emergency room. At that time, they uh, uh, had gone through the refugee clinic and all of them had uh, been screened for TB via uh, PPDs. Uh, both the parents were tested tested positive but had negative chest x-rays and they elect, elected not to take medicines um, that were offered. Both children at the time were negative, the, the patient and the other sibling. Um, in the ED, his temperature was 100.3, uh, but he was uh, not in any respiratory distress. He was awake alert. His exam was remarkable for um, decreased breath sounds in the right lung field, but the rest of his exam was within normal limits. So based on this, the ED performed uh, a chest x-ray. As you can see um, in this x-ray, two-thirds of the right lung are actually affected. Um, you can see this. Uh, there is pleural thickening, so you can see that, you can see that there's a, a pleural effusion there, probably a large one. We can't really see the, um, how much of the uh, uh, lung parenchyma is involved, but presumably some of it is hard to define what is what in here. He also had a lateral decubitus x-ray to see if there was layering of the fluid, and, that was, um, and there was no layering. So he was admitted to the hospital, and he was started on IV antibiotics. Initially, he was started on cestriaxone, and then uh, the next day they added vancomycin. After three days of IV antibiotics, he continued to have fevers daily and uh, very high spikes, but without any changes in his respiratory status. At that point, Pete's ID was consulted. So these are the questions that I want you to think about, and we will come back to those at the end of the presentation. So at this point, think about what is your differential diagnosis? Uh, would you do any further evaluation? Um, do you want to repeat the PPD? Uh, what would be the best sample to send for cultures and what other tests you could do to try to decide what this patient has? We, we will go back to those at the end. So let's jump to review the epidemiology of TB. Worldwide, tuberculosis is the greatest killer to a single infectious agent. Among people with, living with HIV, TB is also the number one killer and it is the main cause of death related to antimicrobial resistance. It is estimated that there are 1.7 billion persons infected with TB worldwide. In other words, about one-third of the world's population has this infection. 
In 2016, there were 10.4 million new cases of TB and 1.7 million deaths due, due to TB in the world. Over 95% of TB occurs in low and middle income countries. About 64% of the reported cases in the world occur in seven countries. These include India, Indonesia, China, the Philippines, Pakistan, Nigeria, and South Africa. In this map, you can see in the dark green, the countries that have rates that are more than 300 cases per 100,000 population. And you can see that most of these countries are from Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa. And there are some countries from Southeast Asia. In the Americas, there are no countries with similar rates. However, based on the number of cases instead of the rate, Brazil is, one, is on the list of the high burden countries in the world. And Peru is on the list of the countries with the highest numbers of MDR TB cases in the world. In 2016, 10% of the new cases were in people living with HIV. It is estimated that at least one third of the people living with HIV in the world are infected with TB. People with the co-infection are 20 to 30 times more likely to develop active TB disease than people without HIV. So HIV and TB form a very, very bad combination. Each of these organisms affects and stimulate the progress of the other. In 2016, about 374,000 people died of HIV-associated TB. Depending on the regions of the world, 20 to 50% of the deaths among people with HIV are due to TB. Multidrug-resistant TB is present in virtually all of the countries that are surveyed by the WHO. 600,000 new cases are resistant to rifampin, and from these, 490,000 were cases of MDR-TB. That means that they were resistant to rifampin and INH in 2016. More than 50% of those were in India, China, and the Russian Federation. Only 22% of these cases were started on adequate treatment, and the cure rate for those is only 54%. And what is even more worrisome is that of the MDR-TB cases, about 6% have what we call extensively resistant drug TB or XDR-TB. This one is extremely hard to treat with a success rate of only 30% in 2014. The estimated number of cases of TB each year is declining but it is very, very slow. Only about 2% decline per year. Between 2000 and 2016, an estimated 53 million lives were saved through the DOT, which stands for Direct Observed Therapy Short Course, and the Stop TV Strategy recommended by the World Health Organization. During this period, the TB death rate dropped by 37%. However, fatality rates vary widely from less than 5% in the U.S. to more than 20% in the African region, highlighting the tremendous inequalities that still persist. Now, looking specifically at children, the WHO estimates that there were a million TB cases in children in 2016. Of these children, 20 to 30,000 were MDR TB cases, and 250,000 children died of TB. Everybody knows and agrees that this is probably an underestimation. According to a recent study using a mathematical model and taking into consideration the, the family dynamics, and exposure in, in the different countries, 
the authors estimate that the real number is probably 25% 25, 25 higher than what the WHO estimates. This is because the WHO estimates are based on reported pediatric cases, and we know that confirmation of TB cases in children is very difficult and very challenging. So underreporting is extremely common, especially in the areas in the world where TB is more common. Now let's turn to the epidemiology of TB in the United States. This is not shown in the map, but since the anti-TB drugs were available in the 1940s, the number of TB cases decreased dramatically over every year to the point that in the late 80s, late 80s, early, no, late 70s, early 80s, it was estimated that maybe by the year 2000, we would eliminate TB from the United States. However, in 1985, something unexpected occurred. The TB cases started increasing in the United States, and there was a significant increase from 1985 to 1992. The factors that contributed to the increase of TB morbidity during this time was the occurrence of the HIV epidemic in the United States. Also, immigration from countries where TB was common increased, and we started seeing transmission of TB in congregate settings, such as like uh, nursing homes, jails, and prisons. The other thing was the development of multidrug resistant TB, which started popping up more frequently then. At the same time these things were happening, there were significant cuts of the funding for the local TB program. So that was a formula for disaster. However, if we look back to the previous graph, you can see that since 1993, the number of cases of TB in the United States started decreasing again. And every year, they have decreased some. At the beginning, that decrease was pretty remarkable, as shown in the uh, by the down arrow. The reason for that decrease was increased funding to TB programs locally, which allowed them to have increased efforts to identify people with TB promptly, initiate appropriate therapy, and ensure completion of therapy. So these patients that are identified with TB are followed until the completion of therapy. However, in the last few years, the decrease in the number of cases in the United States has plateaued, as seen, seen in, the, in the horizontal arrow, to the point that uh, CDC is questioning if the elimination of TB would be achievable. The main barriers for the elimination of TB in the United States include the fact that TB occurs largely in populations that are difficult to reach medically, so-called high-risk populations. And these populations, in these populations, TB is difficult to detect, to diagnose, and to treat. The other thing is that global TB epidemic is still persistent, and the immigration of people from all over the world to the United States is continuous. Finally, our current TB control measures are limited. We need newer tests, newer vaccines, and newer drugs to, in order to achieve TB elimination in the United States. In this map, you can see that TB, the TB rates by state. The states in blue represent the states that, that have rates above the national average which was 2.9 per 100,000 population in 2016. You can see that there are several states that have higher rates than that. In particular, there are four states that carry the number of TB cases in the United States, and those include California, Texas, Florida, and New York. If we look at the TB cases reported by age group, you can see that the pediatric cases, in this case defined as children less than 15 years old, 
actually represent only 4.2% of the total. Almost 50% if you include um, the youth up to age 24. Most of the population with active TB cases are in the 24 to 64 age range, which means that these disease really affects people that are in their productive age. In this graph, we can see the percentage of pediatric cases divided into, into four groups that reflect age-dependent differences in TB pathophysiology. This graph only represents the patients that are younger than 15 years of age. But the important thing in this graph is that 60% of the cases occur in children that are less than four years of age. And this is important to remember because this age group represents the most recent transmission, and also these children are more likely to have severe forms of the disease. They really represent a high-risk population. When we look at the rate of TB and divide them by if the patients were U.S. born versus non-U.S. born, you can see that the rates the rate in the non-U.S. born is represented in blue and the rates of the U.S. born are represented in green. It is clear that the rates in the non-U.S. born are much higher than the rates in the U.S. born. If we look at this in a different way, this graph really represents the number of cases of non-U.S. born persons in the United States and the trend. As you can see, the actual number of the cases, illustrated by the blue bars, has remained relatively the same in the past few years. The decrease in the number of total cases in the United States has occurred mostly because of implementation of the strategies that have affected more of the U.S. population than the foreign-born population. And because of that, each year, the number of cases in non-U.S. born represents a higher percentage of the total number of cases in the U.S. This is represented by the orange line. In 2016, this percentage was 69%. In other words, almost 70% of the total cases of TB in the United States in 2016 occurred in foreign-born persons. In contrast to the overall U.S. TB cases, where two-thirds or 70% occur among non-U.S. born, only about one-quarter of the pediatric cases are among non-U.S. born children. And that fraction has been fairly stable, between 21 to 30% since 1993. This is because many of these young children with TB were actually born in the United States but their families are immigrants. And we will look at this in more detail in, in a little bit. Now, this slide is important to remember. These are the countries from which these cases come. And you know, it's no surprise for anybody that Mexico would be the first one, just because they're our neighbors. But the other countries are the Philippines, India, Vietnam, China, Guatemala, and Haiti. The top countries of origin for non-U.S. born pediatric cases, which is the graph on your right, are different. They're slightly different. However, Mexico is still the number one country of origin. There also has been more diversity in the origin of these cases in 2016 compared to previous years. By the standard categories of race and ethnicity, the greatest number of cases since 1998 has been among Hispanic children, represented in purple, followed by black non-Hispanic children in yellow. However, these two groups have also had the greatest decline in the number of cases since 1993. 
In 2012, there was a study published in pediatrics based on CDC data. This is actually the first time that we take a look at this data, including adolescents. In this study, they included patients from 0 to 18 years of age and also included data that before was not recorded, data on the parent or legal guardian country of origin or if they have lived internationally. So a total of 2,660 cases were identified, and of those, at least one-third were symptomatic at presentation or at diagnosis. So they were discovered by passive investigation. The rest were discovered actively by contact investigation or screening of high-risk groups. But of all the cases, 75% had what the authors called an international connection. So they were either foreign-born or have a foreign-born parent or have resided outside of the United States for a significant amount of time. Only 31% of the cases were actually foreign-born. And of those, 52% were teenagers who had been in the United States for three and a half years or more before the diagnosis. So this highlights perhaps a missed opportunity because these patients should have been screened when they arrived to the United States but they have been here and they just presented with active TB disease. Among the US born, 66% had at least one foreign born parent and 13% have lived in the outside of the United States for more than two months. So there are a lot of things that we can gather from this study. It highlights the importance of the screening questions that we do in our primary care settings about screening for risk factors for TB. And besides asking for the country of origin, we need to ask the country of origin of their parents and also the history of living outside of the United States. Those would be important things to include in your TB screening questionnaires, especially in primary care clinics. Now, moving along to another area that is important to know is the rate of anti-TB drug resistance. You can see that the line on the top, the green line, represents isoniazide resistance, and the line in the bottom represents MDR-TB. Fortunately, the rate of MDR and INH resistance have remained relatively stable, with a little bit of an increase on INH resistance. But the numbers are low. INH is less than 10%, and MDR is, is less than 2%. It was actually 1.2% in 2016. Now, looking at the pediatric TB with drug resistance, remember that drug resistance results are possible only for TB cases that are confirmed by culture results. The counts and percentages that are shown here are based only on the confirmed cases, culture positive cases. The percentage of pediatric cases with resistance to at least one drug increased, during through, um, increased through 2005. Since then, the percentage has varied between 11 to 21 percent. However, the percentage of cases with multidrug resistant TB that is resistant to at least isoniazide and rifampina, has varied from 0 to 2% since 1999. There were no cases of NDR-TB in 2015 among pediatric cases. However, there were some pediatric cases of NDR-TB in 2016, which is not shown in this graph. When we look at MDR-TB dividing the population in U.S. born versus non-U.S. born, we can see that the rates are low. However, the rates in non-U.S. born are double the rates in the U.S. born. So this is important to know because when you're evaluating a patient that could potentially have TB, 
if that person is a foreign born, you have to take into consideration the possibility of INH resistance or MDRTB in deciding what treatment you will start. XDRTB, which is defined as TB that is resistant to INH, rifampin, and chloroquinolone, and at least one of the injectable drugs, does not have a clear epidemiology or a clear trend in the United States. Fortunately, the cases have remained low. In 2016, there was only one reported XDR case in the United States. In this graph, we see the rates of co-infection of TB and HIV. And you can see that it has decreased significantly and it remains low, about 10% for all ages and a little bit higher for the patients that are between 25 and 44 years of age. What is not shown here is the rate of testing uh, for HIV in the pediatric TB cases. However, CDC reports that the, the surveillance result is low. Basically, less than 28% of children with TB are tested for HIV. Of the, sub, of the cases that are tested for HIV, 3.1% HIV, had positive results. This is just to remind us that all TB patients, regardless of age, should be offered HIV testing. That is accordance to the national guidelines. Okay. Time to change gears, and now we're going to talk about microbiology. Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex is the etiology of TB, um, and it includes uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the most common species that causes TB, but also includes Mycobacterium bovis and Mycobacterium africanum. They belong to the order of the Actinomycetales and the family of Mycobactericiae. If you were stain uh, specimens with this, uh, they may show uh, a reaction weakly gram positive or not at all. However, you could see in the, in the gram stain uh, the presence of, of some organisms, so they are so-called ghosts because sometimes you can't really define if they're gram, if they're gram positive or not. So these organisms are acid-fast bacteria, which means that they are resistant to decolorization by the acids used during staining procedures. The three classic staining, AFB staining procedures are the Seal-Nielsen stain and the Kenyon uh, method. And in these, the, the bacilli uh, stains at a bright, bright red under a background of blue or green. But there's also the aramine rhodamine stain, which is specific. This is very sensitive for AFB, and this uses uh, a fluoro, um, fluoroscopy. Um, and you can see that in, in the picture to the far right. So these organisms are fairly large. They're non motile road-shaped bacteria. They are obligate aerobes, and this probably uh, explains a little bit why they like, in particularly, the well aerated areas of the lungs, the upper lobes of the lungs. They're also facultative intracellular organisms, so they actually live in the macrophages and can persist in the macrophages for long periods of time. Um, the cell wall of these organisms is very interesting. It does have peptidoglycan, but 60% of the cell wall is actually lipids, and it is uh, um, known that a lot of the uh, virulence factors for mycobacterium resides in the cell wall. In vitro, it only grows in special media. So we have solid media and liquid media. The classic solid media is the Lowenstein-Jensen medium, which is egg-based, but also the Milbrook medium, which is agar-based. They also grow well in, the auto, in the liquid media, and this is, this is uh, the media that we use in automated radiometric uh, systems like Bactec. The difference in uh, growth is significant because in solid media, it takes six to 10 weeks to grow, but in liquid media, they grow a lot faster, and you can see growth even as short as one week to six weeks. 
And this uh, picture shows the, the colonies growing in the, in the agar media, the small buffered colonies. If you actually uh, stain uh, these uh, colonies and put them on a, on a film, you can see uh, what we call serpentine cords. And this is probably uh, one of the, um, produced by one of the virulence factors in the, in the uh, cell wall, the, what we call the cord factor. And uh, this cord factor is important because it, it actually uh, is um, lytic for the human cells and it also um, inhibits the uh, migration of polymorphonuclear. So it's an important factor in the virulence of the organism. Now let's talk about pathogenesis of, uh, of this disease. So the first thing that we need to know is uh, that there are, like, like I said in the epidemiology, there are persons that have higher risk for exposure or infection to TB. And it's important for us to know which are the populations that have higher risk. So these include close contacts of persons known or suspected to have active TB, uh, foreign board persons from areas where TB is common, or persons that visit those countries, um, the residents and employees of high-risk congregate settings, and these include nursing homes, and jails, and prisons. Also, uh, the medically underserved, homeless, and users of illicit drugs have a high risk of exposure or infection to, with TB. Healthcare workers that serve those high-risk groups are also at an increased risk for um, infection. Children and adolescents who are frequently exposed to adults that have the increased risk factors for infection also have increased risk of uh, exposure and infection. So the transmission of TB um, is airborne. Um, it gets spread through what we call droplet nuclei. When a person that has contagious TB coughs or even sometimes sneezes or shouts or thinks if they have the TB in the larynx, they expel the, uh, these uh, droplet nuclei to the air. The transmission occurs when droplet nuclei are inhaled and they pass uh, through the nasal passages and respiratory uh, um, tract and reach the alveoli in the lungs. So not everybody that is exposed uh, to TB gets infected with it. Uh, the factors that um, affect when TB is transmitted are the susceptibility of the exposed person, so if the, if the person is, um, has an intact immune system or not, the infectiousness of the person that has TB, uh, meaning the number of bacilli that they expel into the air, and that is um, related to the to the um, the type of TB do they, that they have. People with cavitary TB are usually more contagious than people that have nodular TB, for example. The other factor is environmental factors that affect the concent the, the concentration of TB organisms. So uh, closed environments where there is not enough ventilation uh, versus outside uh, places where the UV light actually kills some of the, these organisms. Um, the proximity, the frequency, and the duration of the exposure is a very, very important uh, um, issue. So the, the highest risk is for the close contact of an active case meaning the people that live in the same household or that spend a significant amount of time with the person that has contagious TB. So a casual contact it doesn't have the same risk or not nearly close to the same risk as the person that spends hours with a person who has active TB. TB can be transmitted from young children, although this is, this is uh, very likely uh, due to the fact that children usually do not have a, uh, a large bacterial load and they don't have the force to uh, expel uh, the organisms in, in droplet nuclei. But it has been reported to happen. So the droplet nuclei measure about 5 microns and they contain about 1 to 10 bacilli. The size of them allows them to remain suspended in the air for long periods of time. And it is estimated that 5 to 200 bacilli are necessary for uh, causing infection. 
When the droplet nuclei are inhaled, they enter the lungs and travel to the alveoli. An exception to this is microbacterium bodies, which is not transmitted usually by uh, airborne, but it is uh, transmitted by ingestion of unpasteurized dairy products. Once the uh, tuber tubercular bacilli reach the alveoli, uh, some of them are killed there, but some of them, a few of them, continue to multiply. As they multiply, a small number of the bacilli enter the bloodstream, and then they spread throughout the body. Uh, through the blood, the, these bacilli can reach any part of the body. But there are certain areas that are more likely to uh, be uh, good environments for developing of TB disease. And that includes the upper portions of the lungs, but also the brain, the larynx, lymph nodes, bone, and kidney. So within two to 10 weeks of the, inf the original infection, when the, when, the alveoli, when the bacilli reach the alveoli, the macrophages in the, in the airway, the lower airways, ingest these tubercular bacilli. And they form um, a, a barrier shell around it, what we call a granuloma. And this gives the, the bacilli contain or and under control. So the, uh, the, M, the MTB bacilli are in the macrophages can um, stay alive and, be, and become latent. So they're, they're not actively multiplying, but they're not dead. And this is what we call latent TB infection. If the immune system cannot keep the tubercular bacilli under control, this begins to, to multiply rapidly and uh, it, the immune system is unable to control it, and this causes TB disease. This process of rapid multiplication can occur, in, as I said, in different areas of the body, wherever the bacilli has gone uh, through the bloodstream. So let's talk a little bit more about latent TB infection because that is an important concept to, to know and understand. These uh, granulomas uh, may persist for many, many years. And this is what we call latent tuberculosis infection. But some of them may break down and produce TB disease. Um, in, it takes about two to 10 weeks after the original infection for LTBI, for tuberculosis infection, to be detected via the two tests that we have, the tuberculin skin test and the interferon gamma release assay. Um, at that point, the immune system is usually, if it's an intact immune system, is usually able to stop the multiplication of bacilli and there are no symptoms. At this time, the x-ray is normal and the person is uh, thought to have latent TB infection. People with LTBI are not infections, uh, infectious and they do not spread the organism to others. In the cases where the granulomas break down and the bacilli escape the immune system, they multiply in the different areas and can cause TB disease. This can occur soon after the infection or it can occur years later. Persons with TB disease are usually infectious and can spread the bacteria to others. So the sites where, where TB disease occur uh, can be the lungs, which is by far the most common site. Usually about 75 to 80 percent of the cases occur in the lung, pulmonary TB, and are the most contagious of all the sites. Miliary can occur, miliary TB can occur when the bacilli spread to all parts of the body um, and there are two or more organ systems involved and it could be uh, pretty severe and fatal if it's left untreated. Other sites of disease include lymph nodes, uh, where it can cause a chronic or subacute lymphadenitis, can cause meningitis, otitis media, chronic otitis media or mastoiditis, osteomyelitis, gastrointestinal TB, renal TB, and pretty much TB, once it's spread, it can go anywhere in the body. Extrapulmonary TB is usually not infectious unless the person has concomitant pulmonary disease. So a person can have pulmonary TB and extrapulmonary TB at the same time, and these persons are contagious. Um, if the extrapulmonary disease is in the oral cavity or the larynx, they also can be contagious because only coughing or sneezing or even singing can uh, uh, spread the, nucle the, the, the droplet nuclei into the air. 
Um, or if the extra pulmonary site has an open site and um, there are procedures that can aerosolize the fluid that then become uh, infectious. Now, not everybody that has um, acquired the infection, so latent TB infection, develops TB disease. In a person that has a normal immune system and, and they have a TB infection, if it is left untreated, about 5% of these people with normal immunity will develop TB in the first two years after the infection and then they have a risk of 5% later in life. So 5% in the first couple of years and, an, and another 5% later in life. So a total of the risk in a, in a person with a normal immune system in the general population is about 10% in their whole life to develop TB disease. That means that one out of 10 people that get uh, TB infection will go on to develop disease. Now, if the, if the person that acquires the TB infection has a weakened immune system, uh, the risk is much, much higher. Uh, the best example of this and the people with the highest risk are um, people that are co-infected with HIV, have the, right, the highest risk factors, and their risk is, is estimated to be 7 to 10 percent per year. 7 to 10 percent per year versus the people that have uh, a normal immune system, which is 10% in their whole life. Uh, other conditions that increase the risk uh, include immunosuppressive therapy. So uh, uh, patients that have transplant are on post-transplant medications, prolonged and high doses of corticosteroids, chemotherapy, and tumor necrosis uh, factor alpha antagonists is the most recent one added to this list. Other conditions that uh, increase the risk of developing disease uh, is well, if the infection is recent, we already discussed that the, the, the rate of um, the risk is 5% in the first couple years of life. However, in this group, the infant less than four years of age and the postpubertal adolescents are at increased risk compared to the general population. And this is due to their immune system. In the infants, it's usually because of um, immaturity of their immune system. In the postpubertal adolescents, it is thought that the changes in the puberty cause a little bit of a wane in the immunity. And if they get exposed to TB or have had TB, latent TB, at that point, at that time in their life, they have a higher risk of activation of that and, and developing TB disease. So the, the two peaks that we see in the pediatric population are the younger than four years of age and the postpubertal adolescents. Other conditions that increase the risk include substance abuse and also other conditions like Hodgkin's disease, lymphoma, diabetes, chronic renal failure, silicosis, and malnutrition. So um, a word about drug-resistant TB. So uh, this is caused by organisms that are resistant to one or more TB drugs. They, it's important to understand that they are transmitted the same way as drug susceptible and they're not necessarily more infectious uh, than uh, drug susceptible TB. However, the importance of this is that a delay in detecting the drug resistance may prolong periods of infectiousness because of the delay in starting the correct treatment. So multi-drug resistant TB is defined as the bacteria that are resistant to two drugs, INH and rifampin. Extensively drug-resistant TB is are, it's caused by organisms that are resistant to INH and rifampin plus fluoroquinolones plus one of the three injectable second-line drugs. As you can see in, in this graph, uh, the rates, the, the numbers uh, decrease as we try to, uh, as you go to more resistant strains. And it's important to remember that there are uh, two types of drug resistance primary resistance and secondary resistance. So we call primary resistance when a person gets infected with resistant organisms from, from the get-go versus secondary or acquired resistance is when the person develops TB during therapy and this is when they are not in the correct therapy or not in the enough uh, drugs or they are not adherent to their uh, regimen. So circumstances that increase the risk for drug resistance TB include people that have been exposed to persons that are known to have drug resistance TB or they have a history of prior unsuccessful treatment for TB 
and, and the drug susceptibilities are not known. Uh, if they are coming from a country where drug resistance is more prevalent, and also we suspect when uh, drug resistance TB, when they have positive smears and cultures uh, two months after starting treatment, then that is an indication that we need to suspect drug resistance TB. Okay, so now to finish, I just want to wrap up with the, going back to our original case. So to remind you, this is a six-year-old Bosnian male who went to the emergency room with one week history of fever and uh, some vomiting. He's from Bosnia. The family had immigrated to the U.S. six months prior to his presentation. At the time of uh, arrival to the U.S., he had a negative PPD. And he has this chest x-ray that we describe as a large pleural effusion with potentially some infiltrates there too. So he was admitted to the hospital, was treated with IV ceftriaxone first, vancomycin was added, he was not responding, continued to have fevers, and, uh, and the questions that we were asked was about differential diagnosis, further evaluation, do we need to repeat the TST, what would be the best sample, and what other tests should we need to do. Now, most of these questions are going to be discussed in detail in the next webinar, and so I will encourage you to attend the, the series in order to uh, have an um, understanding of these. But I'll give you what happened with this patient. Um, the, there was a chest ultrasound that was ordered, and it showed a loculated organized pleural effusion. Surgery was consulted, and they performed a video-assisted thoracotomy and decortication, VAT. And because we had suspicion of TB, of course, that was in our differential diagnosis, we recommended that not only they would send the pleural fluid, but to send also a pleural biopsy and to send AFB cultures and PCRs on the pleural fluid and on the tissue, as well as the, bacterial, the regular bacterial cultures. We did repeat the PPD, and it was read in 48 hours or 22 millimeters of induration. So if you recall, six months before, he had a negative PPD, and now he has a 22 millimeters of induration. We recommended to do induced sputums, and one of them was done. However, then they changed the, the, the strategy to do gastric aspirates, and there were three of those done. We also requested an HIV antibody, and that was negative. The patient, based on these findings, was the, just the, the PPD on, on its own and the fact that it wasn't responding to IV antibiotics, was started on four drugs, INH, rifampin, pyrazinamide, and etambutol, and he improved with resolution of the fever, and he was discharged home to continue uh, uh, therapy uh, with direct observed therapy. The final results, his three gastric aspirates were negative smears and negative cultures. The induced sputum has a, had a negative smear. The pleural biopsy showed multiple caseating granulomas. The pleural fluid and the pleural tissue were sent for AFB smear and PCR, and they were negative. However, uh, in about four weeks, the induced sputum and the pleural tissue cultures grew mycobacterium tuberculosis, and it was resistant to INH. So just to wrap it up, things that we learned from this case. First of all, just a reminder about the epidemiology and risk factors. So TB should be considered in a child with pneumonia that is not responding to appropriate antibiotics, especially if the patient is foreign born. So there should be a red light in there just because they're foreign born. Remember that in, in regards to pathogenesis that it may take up to 10 weeks from exposure to show a positive PPD. So this patient had immigrated and had a PPD soon after immigration, and he obviously was in the incubation period, and um, he did, had not had time to convert to PPD. Uh, his parents actually did not have TB, so it was, and we could not find a source case for him, so he probably acquired the TB right before he left his country. So that's important to know, the limitations of your testing. It could take up to 10 weeks to convert. Other things that we learned from this case is that it is very important to obtain cultures in children, especially when the source case is unknown, uh, and that induced sputums may be actually better samples than gastric aspirates in older children. So uh, we should be considering that in older children. And for treatment, remember that we need to suspect drug resistance in any foreign-born patient with TB and use the fourth drug, etambutol, until the susceptibilities are available. So now we can uh, have time for questions. Um, Dr. Maraca, I think it's uh, 
I thank you for the for offering and volunteering to monitor and uh, recall collect the questions. So if you have any questions, this is the time. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Alvarez. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. So uh, uh, we have a few questions from the participants. Uh, the first refers to the 2008-2010 study of pediatric and adolescent TB where the 2,660 cases were described and the parent uh, uh, status was determined. The question is, uh, were the, those 2,660 cases active TB cases or latent TB cases or both, uh, as far as you know? Those were active TB cases. Okay. So that was based on, that was based on, that, that study was um, CDC, CDC data. Uh, so the the authors actually work for the CDC, um, and and this was based on the on cases because uh, the CDC doesn't collect uh, data on latent TB. Okay, thank you. And then the second question uh, is regarding the graphs where it's not uh, uh, listed what age group uh, we're talking about. Were those graphs uh, talking about TB cases only in pediatrics, or was it referring to the TB in the U.S. as a whole? Um, which, I, I don't know if I can go back to the, yes. can I go back to the presentation? So the ones, for example, talking about uh, MDR TB and the foreign-born versus U.S.-born cases. Okay, so and the, the drug-resistant TB or just the U.S.-born versus foreign-born? It's, it's actually not, not in the question itself, but I presume both, probably. Okay. So what is the question again now that I'm looking at the graph? I'm so as, as you're looking at these, are these cases only in uh, pediatric TB or uh, refer to TB in, uh, as a whole in adult and pediatrics? It, no, this is the whole. This is uh, everybody. Um, yeah, adults and pediatrics. Okay, thank you. Another question is regarding the high-dose corticosteroid uh, putting patients uh, at risk. Uh, does that include topical route or only systemic corticosteroids? Uh, only systemic corticosteroids, and it is really defined as uh, high dose and um, also duration more than two weeks of, uh, of duration. So short, for example, um, short courses that are used routinely for um, something like reactive airway disease or asthma are not considered um, uh, risk, fact risk factors for um, developing disease. But it's the, the high dose, longer courses are the ones that are considered a risk factor. All right, thank you. Uh, somebody is also asking, uh, do you use etambutol in all your pediatric patients? Um, that is a good question, and as I said, a lot of uh, a lot of the the um, details about some of the management tests and treatment and all that will be discussed in, in uh, other webinars. But just to uh, answer the question, uh, the only time yeah we we tend to use a tambutol in most of the patients, and only um, we don't use it when we have for example, the source case for a, pa a pediatric patient and if the susceptibility of the, of the drug case, the source case is known and it is uh, uh, pan-susceptible and the patient does not have uh, a severe case of, of um, TB disease, meaning, for example, a patient that has just a high lymphadenopathy and we know that they don't have any risk factor for uh, drug-resistant TB especially if we know that um, the susceptibilities of the isolate from the source case, then we do not use it. So basically, uh, the, the, the philosophy is that we start with four drugs unless we are convinced that we don't need the tambutol, uh, versus before we used to only start three and then only add a tambutol if we have suspicion for, um, multi, for drug resistant TB. So it just a uh, change a little bit on the philosophy. So we don't start attempting on everybody, but we have a low threshold to do it. All right, thank you. And then uh, if there is somebody who's never had a positive PPD and is low risk and gets a seven millimeter PPD, could you uh, comment on what that means? Yeah, there there is. A, I think your lecture next next month is going to cover that. But yes. If somebody has no risk factors, a seven millimeter in duration is considered negative. 
All right, and uh, could you comment on any general thoughts on, on the uh, conversion length between the infection and developing disease? Uh, is there, are there any thoughts on how long it takes and, uh, in, and is it different in children and adults? Um, yes, actually there is, uh, I, I didn't put that in there, but maybe we can include it in the next one. There is actually a very nice timetable uh, that was developed by um, uh, this guy. I'm, I'm missing the name right now, but um, the, this doctor that took care of, of patients in an in a, um, institutionalized patients, and he studied the nat this was many years ago before even treatment for TB. He studied the natural course of TB in the in these kids. This was in pediatrics. And basically, they, he developed a timetable. So, for example, for, like, like we said, from infection, the, the exposure and the infection to conversion, it's up to 10 weeks, about up, up to 10 weeks. Um, the patients that develop pulmonary disease, um, especially the, 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 the young kids that develop miliary TB and TB meningitis, so the more severe um, presentations uh, tend to occur actually earlier, about three to six months after the infection, so from point zero from the infection. Uh, the, the ones that have milder disease, usually the range is around, and I'm just going by memory here, but around the, the range is about maybe six months. Uh, per persons that develop, for example, uh, osteomyelitis for, with TB, the, 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 the incubation period or the time from infection to actual presentation is much longer, more like 9 to 12 months after the infection. And for example, renal TB presents years later. It could be a year or even five years after the original infection. So we do have an idea of, uh, of the timeline depending on where the presentation is. And, and the, um, as I said, the more severe cases tend to present uh, sooner because they also present also in the younger kids, in the less than four years of age. All right. Uh, I think we, we have some more questions uh, that will be covered by later topics in the series. Uh